everyone. It's good to see everybody here tonight. We'll go ahead and get everybody to stand. We're going to start tonight. We're going to sing, He Knows My Name. Let's just worship Him tonight. Good evening. Good to see you. How y'all doing tonight? I may not know every name here, but he knows your name, okay? Amen. Would you please bow your heads and hearts with me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Father God, this is your day. We're so grateful you've allowed us to open our eyes and to experience this day, Father God. God, I thank you, Lord, also God, for the service here tonight, dear Father God. And we just want to invite you, God, to uh, just to, uh, express yourself through your word tonight, dear God. And help us, God, to express our worship to you tonight, dear Father God. And God, I thank you so very much for how you will use the service here, God, in the service in the back, dear God, God, just to help us, just to exalt you tonight, dear God, so that we will be drawn closer to you, dear God, because every confession of every heart should be, Lord, less of us and more of you. Father, we love you, and we thank you in advance for how you honor this prayer, and God, we do pray it believing because we ask it in the name of Jesus, and if you can agree with that prayer, help me say amen. Amen. Please be seated. A few things 
I do want to share with you tonight. And the first is um, next week. Please just make a note. This is in your. This will be in the bulletin that we print this Sunday. But next week is Thanksgiving week. We we will not be meeting on Wednesday, but we uh, we will meet on Tuesday night. And what we're going to do? Do something just a little, maybe a, a, a lot different. We will not have a service in here, but we're going to meet back in the fellowship hall. So we just want it just to be intimate time to share praises and to share a testimony. It is Thanksgiving, so be, um, be aware this, this whole week, what do you want to give thanks for? What do you want to share with your church family? Matter of fact, let's take it to the next level. What do you think God wants you to give thanks for next Tuesday night with your church family. So uh, we just encourage you to also bring uh, maybe your favorite desserts. We're not doing full finger foods or anything like just desserts and coffee, and, and that'll be the pregame show to Thanksgiving. Can I get a witness, all right, coming up next week? So I look forward to that service. Um, I want to share with you a card here. This is from Miss Miss uh, Miss Gloria, uh, dear Black Rock family. Our family cannot thank you enough for all the love and support you showed us, you showered us with during Alton's illness and following his passing. Every word spoken and gesture made eased our minds and provided great comfort. Thank you for the beautiful peace lily. Thank you to the entire team for working so hard to provide our entire family and friends with such an amazing meal. Alton was so proud to be part of a church, uh, to be part of a church uh, of such a wonderful church family. We cannot thank you enough for honoring Alton as you did. And that's from Miss Gloria. Also, uh, another thing I want to share with you, many of you through the years have heard David Ring. He's an evangelist. Uh, we, got, we got his flyer, and I'm going to put this in the back on the table. You know, he, he will be at Spring Hill Baptist Church on Sunday, November the 27th. That is the Sunday after Thanksgiving for two services, and Monday and Tuesday. Uh, um, I've heard him through the years. Great, you know, great speaker. You know, great story, great testimony. I believe he had cerebral palsy. He has a, a speech impediment because of that. But don't tell him that because he just grips it and rips it. A great, great preacher of the gospel. And so I want to pass on that information to you, let you know about that. And also, just another um, information for you, and that is um, tomorrow is our senior adult luncheon that our church is hosting for this uh, whole association. It starts at 1030, and of course it is a luncheon, so we'll have a lunch afterwards. But also Friday, we, uh, we will be hosting a... A funeral service here for uh, the McKendry family. Many of you knew Chris as a young boy and all through his years and the illness he had. Uh, um, um, that service is going to be at 1 o'clock here Friday. We'll serve the family lunch prior to the service. That's a little different than what we normally do, but this, we had to uh, accommodate them. So this, the luncheon will be 1130. So if you can help bring some food items, if you can, let Miss Crystal know tonight in advance. And we would appreciate that. At this time, would you please stand to your feet and go tell somebody you love them. We return to our seat. Let's sing since Jesus came into my heart. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. 
I have light in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I am possessed of a hope that is steadfast and sure. Since Jesus came into my heart, and the dark clouds of doubt now my pathway obscure. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I shall go there to dwell in that city I know. Since Jesus came into my heart, and I'm happy, so happy as onward I go. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll since jesus came into my heart amen you may be seated we're going to sing trust and obey for there is no other way this will be offered to him when we walk with the lord in the light of his word what a glory he sheds on our way. Let us do his good will. He abides with us still. And with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toll he doth richly repay. Not a grief or a loss, not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the what he says we will do, where he sends we will go, never fear, only trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Heavenly Father, God, we do thank you, Lord, for this opportunity you've given us to be in your house tonight. And Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you bestow upon us so freely every day. We thank you mostly, Lord, for that blessing from 2,000 years ago, Lord, where you, where you sent your son to die on the cross of Calvary to wash away our sins. Father, we thank you for that. Father, may we never, ever take that lightly, Father. 
<clears throat> Father, I do pray for the McKendry family. I pray for I pray for uh, Miss Gloria Jones, Lord, too, as she's uh, all dealing with the loss of uh, Brother Alton, Lord. She knows where he's at, Father, but we know that we'll miss him, Lord, and we just we just thank you, Lord, for his testimony in our lives, Father. Now, Father, and, and Chris McKendry's family, I do pray for them, Lord, Father. You know the need there, Father, and I pray that you'll just comfort them in this time of loss. And Father, as we uh, take up this offering, I would pray, Lord, that it be used to do your divine will, Lord, on this earth. And Father, that you would not only bless the gift, but also the giver, if we ask all this in Jesus Christ's holy and precious name. Amen. Just real quick, let me give you a few updates for those of you who might who may not have a chance to check your email or if you do not get the email. Joan and Miss Patty um, Dix both had a procedure done this past week. Also, um, with Ron Turner, all three of them are doing well. Uh, Miss uh, Patty come home today. Miss Joan should be coming home tomorrow. And all of them are doing rather well, so we give God the praise for that. Amen. Take a copy of God's Word and find the 19th chapter of the Gospel of John. John chapter number 19, and when you find your place there, if you could physically stand, would you please stand with me tonight as we honor and reverence the reading of the Word of God together, a preaching of this on this subject tonight, paid in full, paid in full, John chapter 19, begin, I begin reading verse number 25, and now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Father God, I pray that you would speak deep into our hearts, and may you do it for our good, but for your glory. We pray, believe him, because we ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. Paid in full. So tonight, we are moving beyond the events that preluded Jesus' death into the actual details of Jesus' death. Now, death is usually a natural occurrence, but not with Jesus because there was not anything natural about him. Even the details of our Lord's death 
were supernatural. There was nothing natural about what he endured. Everything was supernatural. I want you to draw, I want to draw your attention tonight uh, to, uh, to uh, verse 25, 26, and 27. And I want you to take notice of those who were in attendance during our Lord's final hours. Notice those that were there. The Bible gives a roll call of those that were closely linked to Jesus. And we see there in verse 25, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. So as we, as we notice uh, the roll call, those who were in attendance there, there were five people who were closely linked or had any kind of association with Jesus. Four of them were ladies and only one man. Do you get that? Four ladies and one man. So if you were preaching this sermon tonight, what would be your point right here? Where's the rest of the men at, right? Is that a good question? Where's the rest of the men? And so we see that the men were outnumbered four to one. And so as we look around the sanctuary tonight, has much changed in 2,000 years? Not much at all, okay? So basically, if you was preaching this sermon, you'd say this. You'd look at me. If I'm a man sitting down here, you'd look at the rest of the men. You'd say this. Men, we need to man up. Is that right? Now, you know, I get it, preacher. You know, I'm a man. I'm here. And this is for the rest of the men who aren't here. And I'd say amen to that. They need to man up. And they need, to, they need to be here. That's a good point right there. So there's more here to see, though, than just the unbalanced gender support. I think there's something even more, uh, 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 even more uh, 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 deeper uh, in spiritual truth and principle that can be drawn out of that. Notice the, notice the who was there. There was four ladies. Three of them had the name Mary. One didn't. And I'm kind of thinking she might have felt a little left out. Is that right? You know, good night. Why can't my name be Mary? She's probably thinking. But so this one woman whose name was not Mary, her name was Salome. You read the other Gospels, we find out who she was married to. But more importantly, we find out who her sons are. The one, one of the ladies, who her name was not Mary, Salome, uh, she had two sons. The Gospel labels them a little nickname. They were called the Sons of Thunder. Does anybody remember who they were? Shout them out. The sons of thunder, sons of Zebedee, James and John, known as the sons of thunder. Now, if you remember through the Gospels, uh, she made a rather unusual request. Now, here's, here's James and, and John's mom. They're um, walking along with Jesus, and so it just something rises up in her. And so she has an unusual request, and she asked Jesus this. Uh, Lord, uh, uh, when, we get, when we all get to heaven, can you please give my two sons... Can you give each of them a seat of prominence? Can you put one on your right hand and you could put one on your left hand? Is that all coming back to y'all now? Do y'all remember that? She had an, an unusual request. Lord, I want my boys to have the best seats in heaven. Guess what Jesus said? No. <laughs> well, he didn't really say it in those words. But he said, that's not for me to give. So watch this. She made a prayer request and Jesus turned her down. Okay, preacher, where are you going with this? Watch this. She, de- oh, excuse me, he, Jesus, declined her prayer request, yet she is still loyal to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? That says a lot about her. Because oftentimes, when we, as, as sincere believers, when we ask God a sincere request, and that we think that he is obligated to answer it because we have prayed, we have asked in faith, and when he does not answer your request the way you want him to answer it, do you get better and draw away from him, or do you still love him because he saved your soul? This woman here, obviously, it didn't affect her. Although her request was denied, although uh, he told her no, she still loved him, and she was still loyal to Jesus down to the very end. One, uh, one other observation we must mention before we move on, and this is definitely warranted that we spend some time pointing this out. Notice that Jesus assigned the responsibility of his mother to the apostle John rather than to one of his biological brothers. Do you notice that? 
Look at verse 26. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, we knew that was John, uh, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. So why is it then that Jesus didn't say to his other stepbrothers, he had, a, he had some other stepbrothers, why did he call them out and say, hey guys, take care of mom in my absence? He didn't do that. But instead, he, uh, um, uh, he, he, he assigned the responsibility of his mother to John. Now watch this now. Here's what I believe. I'm convinced this implies that his spiritual family superseded his biological family. You might disagree with that, but I'm convinced that this, our spiritual family supersedes our biological family. But watch this. It is great, though, when we have both of them. When we have, when my mom is in church and my wife is in church and my brother, when, you're, when your biological family is part of the supernatural family, that's an added bonus. But I'm convinced that Jesus is showing us here that the family of faith, you say it all the time. You say, man, you know what, preacher? I, I'm closer to my church family than I am my own family. That's because you love Jesus and they don't quite know him yet. Okay, And just in case you're not convinced that we're, we're going in the right direction with this, Listen to what Jesus said in Mark 3, verse 34 and 35. Just in case you want to check this out later, once again, that's Mark 3, verse 34 and 35. Jesus speaking, he said these words, And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for, who, for, who, for whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and mother. At this point when Jesus is on the cross, it is believed that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was a widow, that Joseph had died. Yes, he did have other, he had other stepbrothers, but James, the one that wrote the epistle that bears his name, we know that he did not become a believer until after the resurrection. So could it be that his other stepbrothers were unbelievers, and could it be then also that is what warranted Jesus? He wanted to make sure that his mother was taken care of, not just by anybody. He did not want to send her home. Listen, she had just, she was in the process of losing her son. Can you imagine how discouraged and how, and, and how much sorrow she was experiencing? Jesus knew that if he would have sent her home to his unbelieving stepbrothers, that they would have just discouraged her even more. So what he did, he t- he got a, a disciple, a believer, to take care of his mom. Well, I don't want to berate that point, but, but I, I'm convinced. I'm not sure if you're convinced, but I know I am. Verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. So understand, he was enduring real human suffering because he had a real human body. He hurt when that, uh, when, uh, when that cat of nine tails that was weighted down with bone and metal, he felt that because he had a human body. He hungered throughout the Scripture. We know he ate. And here, uh, uh, while he's on the cross, one of the seven sayings that Jesus uttered was, I thirst. So what does the Scripture say the Roman soldiers did? Well, they offered him some cheap vinegar wine. So they gave Jesus a sour drink. Let me say it one more time. They gave Jesus a sour drink. Can I ask you a question tonight? What kind of drink are you giving to Jesus? It's one thing to talk about what the Romans gave him, but we plow a little closer to the corn when we start thinking about what kind of drink am I giving to Jesus? Oh, come on, preacher, stop spiritualizing this. I, I don't give him a drink. Yes, you do. Oh, yes, you do. I do, and you do as well. Can I illustrate that to you? Notice in Matthew 25, verse 34 through 40, Jesus is speaking. Then he says, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? 
When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or did we see, or, or, or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Now here's a bombshell. Watch this. Our treatment of one another is a reflection of our treatment towards Jesus Christ. So based on on how we treat others, what kind of drink are we giving to Jesus? Verse 29, verse 30, excuse me, verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. The phrase, it is finished, in the Greek, that that is testelestai, and it literally means paid in full. It, 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 It translates that it stands finished and will always Always be finished. How many times did Jesus die? Just once. Listen, I promise you this. He will never have to come back and go through the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the crucifixion again. He died once and for all. He'll never have to do it again. It was, it is, it, it'll stand complete. He paid our debt in full. I mean, who would dare add anything to Michelangelo's work in the Sistine Chapel? Can you imagine a, a guy with a paintbrush and some, and, and some Walmart paint walking into the Sistine Chapel? Hey, Bo, what you doing? Well, I'm going to go touch up Michelangelo's work. What? No. You don't add anything to a masterpiece. Who dare would add anything to Mozart's compositions? You, you don't add anything to a masterpiece. Listen, who would dare add anything to the atoning death of the Lord Jesus Christ? There is nothing left for us. To add to it, it is finished. Stories told of an evangelist named Alexander Wooten. Wooten was approached by a rather flippant young man who asked him, What must I do to be saved? It's too late, he replied and went about his business. Becoming alarmed, the young man said, Do you mean it's too late for me to be saved? Is there nothing I can do? Too late, said Wooten. It's already been done. The only thing you can do is believe. The Bible says he gave up his spirit. You know, it kind of reminds me of the old saying, why do men die before women do? Because they want to. <laughs> why did Jesus die? Make no mistake, friends, he died because he wanted to. If he did not want to die, he would not have died. If he did not want to die, he would have called upon the thousands of angels who would have res- who would have come on a the greatest rescue mission ever and snatched him away from that moment make no mistake because of his great love towards humankind he did exactly what he wanted to do verse 31 therefore because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the sabbath for the sabbath was a high day the jews asked pilate that their legs might be broken and that it might be taken away. So here we see that the, the Jews were concerned. They were running out of time. So in order to expedite crucifixion, they asked that, the, that Pilate give his Roman soldiers uh, the, uh, uh, the right to go ahead and break their legs. Why in the world would they break their legs? If you understand the process of crucifixion, whether, whether if you can imagine their feet being nailed upon that, the, that peg that jotted out of the cross, that beam, and they rested on that. And so every, every so often they would push up so their lung cavity could open up and breathe and exhale and inhale. So the, in order to expedite and to hurry up and rush along the death process, their legs were broken. Can you imagine having your legs just snapped Legs were broken so they could, not, they could no longer push themselves up. Them two thieves, one on each side of Jesus, each of them had their legs broken so they could not push up. So they actually they, they, they died by suffocation because they were not able to breathe. So when they got to Jesus, notice verse 32, then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the others who were crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already what? Already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. 
and he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. So that you may believe what? So that you may believe that Jesus died upon the cross. You need to understand, the Apostle John wrote this gospel some 60 to 70 years after these events took place. So by the time he was in the process of writing this gospel, there were already so many rumors spreading around that Jesus did not really die, that uh, he just kind of nearly passed out, and he, he didn't resurrect in the tomb. He just kind of revived and woke up in the tomb, and the disciples rolled the stone away. No, that is what John, John 70 years in the midst of all of the, of the lies and all of the rumors going on, he wrote what he wrote. He said there in verse 34 and 35 that he was an eyewitness. And he, verse 35, and he who has seen has testified and his testimony is true. And he knows that he's telling the truth so that you may believe. Why else would John in such great detail go to the extremes to tell us that Jesus' legs were not merely broken, but that they, when they even hinted, that he was already dead. They did not break his legs like they did the other, the, 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 uh, other thieves on the cross. But they pierced his side. And by the way, that Roman soldier didn't know that. But he was fulfilling an Old Testament prophecy that the Messiah would be pierced. But John in great detail wrote that, one, that once he was pierced, blood and water flowed out. There lies in the, uh, enough proof that should be enough proof for any skeptic to know that he actually died. You know, in the, in the serum, when you actually, when you die, the serum in your body is divided. And that is why blood and water come out separately because he was dead. Verse 37. And again, another scripture says, They shall look on him whom they pierced. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with, with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. And now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no man, excuse me, in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day for the tomb was nearby. So here we have two distinguished men of Israel. Here we have Joseph of Arimathea and we have Nicodemus, perhaps two of the richest men in Israel at that time. Now prior to Calvary, they were both incognito disciples. They were undercover. They were secret disciples, but no longer were they undercover. Listen, Calvary made the difference in their lives. Through the finished works of the Lord Jesus Christ, they come out of the dark into the light. They come undercover, and they come and they express their desire to Pilate to have the body of Jesus to give him a proper Burying. For two people of such prominence and wealth and power that they had to join together in burying a crucified man meant that this alleged criminal had dramatically changed their lives. What made the difference in their lives? Can I tell you the same thing that makes a difference in our lives? The finished works of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you not a different person because of Calvary? If you remember who you used to be before you come to know Jesus Christ, you would testify that the works of Jesus Christ has dramatically changed your life. So consider the implications of these two men. The, the implications were they could have had re faced rejection by their peers, which they probably did. They would have been disenfranchised and kicked out of the synagogue. And to top it all off, they literally touched a dead body. Every person in the building, you know, that was a no-no for a Jew. Is that right? It, that, was, that, would, that would have immediately defiled them and left them unworthy, and they would have had to sit out and not participate in the Passover. But after all, 
what difference did it make to them? Because they found the Lamb of God. All the mother little lambs that were being sacrificed at Passover. Listen, I don't think it bothered them one bit that they were not allowed to participate in the temple sacrifices because they found the greatest temple. They found the greatest lamb ever when they found Jesus. I want to conclude this message tonight by elaborating on something that the Scripture doesn't even speak on. Well, how can I explain something that was not even mentioned in Scripture, you may ask? Because it's my sermon, I want to preach it, okay? Listen, detailed description is given to the process of carefully taking down Jesus' body from the cross. They carefully wrapped him in strips of linen not like the rags that the other criminals were wrapped in. Uh, uh, they carefully took him down, wrapped him in the strips of linen. They, they had the 100-pound weight of, uh, uh, of expensive oils that, uh, that was brought there. And he was buried as a king because he was a king. Okay, the Scripture mentions that. So what part am I speaking of about what the Scripture does not say? We know what kind of burial Jesus had. Have you ever thought this before? What kind of burial did those other two thieves have? I can promise you this. I don't think nobody showed up to take care of them. Do you know the common practice when a thief was on a cross? Once they were pronounced dead, their bodies were taken down, and they were thrown into what we know as the Valley of Gehenna. And if you do not know what that is, that was the city dump, garbage dump. The Bible describes Gehenna as where uh, or the fire never dies. Or where the worm never dies and the fire is not quenched. So we see the death, the burial of Jesus. Follow me now, stay with me. These two thieves, both taken down. Both of them were thrown into the valley of Gehenna. Both of their lives ended in a burning garbage dump. But one of them opened his eyes in the torments of hell. And yet the other one opened his eyes to the treasures of paradise. Both died guilty. Both, desired, both died deserving. Both were thrown onto the garbage dump. But one opened his eyes in paradise. And guess who the first person he saw was? Jesus. Jesus said to him, today you'll see me in paradise. Friends, what a difference Calvary makes. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Father, we rejoice tonight, dear Father God, in the finished works of the cross. We are so grateful that salvation, uh, the, 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 uh, the debt has been paid in full, and there's nothing more we need to do, yet only believe God, if we would put our, our, our trust and our confidence in you, your word teaches us that we will be saved. God, I pray tonight for that one. If there is a man or woman here tonight who has yet to place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, God, may they see that their work is done. There is nothing more that can be done. Then they are indeed too late because you have already done everything necessary. God, if they would just believe in you tonight. So, God, I thank you for opening the eyes of their heart. God, let them see what they need to do is to accept the finished works of Jesus Christ. And God, I pray for the believer, God, that is here tonight. God, I pray that we are not a secret uh, a service type Christian, dear God. But God, but help us to uh, just to, uh, to continue, God, to live boldly and to proclaim your name and to make much of you. And God, help us to never get over the difference that, the, that, uh, that Calvary has made in our lives. God, help us to never forget what you have saved us from and what you have saved us to. You have saved us from hell. You have saved us unto good works. So God, I thank you for the opportunity to live for you. And God, uh, may, our, may our attitude never be, oh, I got to live for Jesus, but may it always be, I get to live for Jesus. 
Lord God, may you be honored through our, uh, our um, invitation time now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you please stand with us tonight? Please stand, and, and if you are here tonight and you have been prompted by the Holy Spirit of God to, um, to pray a prayer of repentance and to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ, would you do that tonight? It's as simple as, uh, uh, dear, dear Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner. I need to be saved, and I want to be saved. Only you, God, can save me. Tonight I receive you as my Savior and as my Lord. With your help and your strength, I'll live for you. Maybe that needs to be your prayer. Maybe you've already settled that. And maybe there is no longer a question mark at the end of your salvation experience. If there is not, I say, hallelujah, praise God. Now that you know that you belong to Jesus, friend, you're just here tonight just to be encouraged, to continue to love him. And you know what? You might be like Salome. You might be here tonight, and, and there has been times where God hasn't answered your prayers, but yet you're still loyal to the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody has said it, and they said it well, that faith is not always getting what you ask for. And I believe that because there have been a lot of things that I have asked for in faith and, and God did what he wanted to do. And guess what? He's God and he can do that. So I'll say this tonight. Faith is not always getting what you ask for. Sometimes faith is not getting what you ask for and yet loving Jesus anyways. So maybe, maybe you were here tonight just to hear that. Just to hear that little nugget of encouragement to continue to love Jesus anyway although he may not have given you exactly what you asked for. So continue to love him. If there is a prayer that needs to be prayed, would you pray it tonight as we sing? Please bow your heads and hearts and join me in an attitude of prayer tonight. Father God, first of all,